Hi, I am Molly Barnes. Welcome to our show. My guest today is Gregorio Luke, who is a, a fascinating man and currently and for the past seven years the director of the Museum of Latin, America, Latin American Art in Long Beach, California. It's a fabulous, fabulous museum, something that you should all see. And uh, he's a fascinating man. Welcome, Gregorio. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Tell me how this came about, your job here, and a little about your background. You were, worked for an ambassador. You were a liaison to South America, Latin America. How did it all happen? Well, I, I was, uh, for many years, I was a cultural attache of Mexico. How did that happen? Uh, by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Everything seems to happen to you Everything and to me by accident. Everything happens by accident. I, I was, uh, uh, it was uh, like in, in the late 80s and... Uh, Mexico had a new ambassador to the U.S., and uh, this man wanted to have a different type of cultural diplomacy. He wanted a much more active, and he wanted a different type of cultural attaché, not the stodgy intellectual, but he wanted a, a militant, so to speak, a guy that would go out there and speak and talk and, and, uh, and, and get some interest going. And so I, I went to Washington, and I lived there several years. Uh, at those, in, those, in those years, that there was a very important exhibit on Mexican art, uh, 30 Centuries of Splendor. Where? Where was it? Was it was in New York. And uh, for, for a couple of months, uh, the entire Mexican culture was all over New York in those days. And, um, and there was many other things. It was an effervescent moment. And uh, I stayed in Washington a couple of years. And then uh, in the mid-'80s, in '86. There was this governor in California that was, uh, you know, bashing the immigrants, something like similar to what is happening now, uh, and a very anti-Mexican policy. And uh, he had these initiatives to forbid immigrants to, to, to use social services, all these things. And so uh, it was decided by, you know, my, my, the ambassador and the consul that I was ideal to come in there as a as a representative of Mexican culture and to put the emphasis on Mexico and Mexico's contributions and to try to, to create a positive image for Mexico. So I came here and I lectured in all the high schools everywhere. I, I uh, got a lot of practice because once they, they, you go into a high school of 800 kids and they turn off the light and you talk to them about art, you better be interesting. <laughs> You know, so I learned a lot, and it was, uh, uh, and at the time, there was this new museum that wanted uh, to start uh, a program dedicated exclusively to Latin American fine art. And, and this museum is located in the city of Long Beach, California. And they wanted, at the time, to get a show of Diego Rivera, but it was very young, the museum, it did not have a track record, and so they were having some difficulties in getting the owners, it was a, a Mexican state, the state of Veracruz, to lend them the collection. So they, I talked with them, and I was convinced, and, and I helped them get this show. So uh, I started developing a relationship with them, and uh, eventually my, my stay in LA was about to finish, and I was gonna probably get posted some other place. And I decided that I was not going to continue with this life of the diplomat in which, you know, you're always, just when you begin to reap uh, the fruits of your efforts and you begin to feel comfortable in a city and you begin to feel that you know anybody, you get posted somewhere else and you have to start all over again. So I was offered to direct the museum and I accepted it and I've been there for the past uh, seven years. And Who is the doctor is, uh, that makes it all happen? The founder and the, the chairman of this museum is uh, Robert Gumbiner, who is a physician and uh, is a man that had a, a large medical group and uh, who believed that uh, art helped people heal. That was his idea. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I do too. And uh, he, of the art that was available, the one that he found uh, the, the, that had more energy and more color and also was the most accessible was Latin American art. Well, this reminds me in a way of the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia because uh, although they have not uh, had enough money as a grant when Barnes died, he really, really loved the old masters. So you go into the museum and everything is filled with Matisse's, Picasso's, 
every, Rivera, everything's sort of falling off the wall, but you have a real feeling of culture. And I, that's what I feel when I go to your museum. It's extraordinary. I went down one day to see you, and you'd already gone to lunch when I got there, and one of the docents was free and just took me on a trip. And it was the most exciting afternoon I've had in years. It was wonderful. And the slides we've just seen, where we've seen pictures of the museum, who designed it? Well, the museum is right now undergoing an expansion. And the architect is Manuel Rosen. It looks very much like Gaudi or... Well, it's part of the Mexican school of architecture that is considered like uh, people refer to modern Mexican architecture like the quiet revolution because it's not as loud as the muralist movement. Right, exactly. But it's equally impressive. Figures like uh, Luis Barragan, yeah. like Legorreta, like Abraham Sabludovsky, many people that really transformed uh, the, the landscape of Mexican urban centers. And, and Manuel Rosen uh, is a fabulous designer. The, the Mexican architecture has, tends to be very sculptural you know, its forms, uh, very dramatic in its use of color. And our museum has all those features. We will have it ready maybe in some six more months, we hope, in the but spring you, of 07. But you have said to me that museums usually just show very famous or dead artists. Of course. And you have tried very hard to keep this a living museum, and yet you have shown a lot of the top dead artists from Latin America. Who are some of them? Well, this museum's mission is to show artists that live or work in Latin America from 1945 to the present. So uh, this is a, a decision that, that was made by the chairman, by Dr. Gumbiner. And so it, it forces us to uh, give opportunity to mo many artists that are young, that are alive. Of course, I mean, we could probably sneak in a Rivera or a Botero, that we've had shows of them, or Tamayo. But most of the artists that we have are artists that are well-known in Latin America, but not in the U.S. Uh, some of them absolutely magnificent. Right now we have a show by the Venezuelan kinetic artist Jesus Soto. You know, I didn't know who he was when I saw the show, and then I went to New York, and he has no a number of pieces in the Museum of Modern Art. Oh, he's amazing. He had a solo show in, in the Guggenheim. He's all over Europe. And he is a, a, a true innovator. You know, an artist that is not just repeating what others have done before, but who really takes the, the art a step further, uh, exploring issues like the third dimension or creating works that are a physical demonstration of the Eisensteinian idea that matter and energy are the same. So he does these works where, you know, suddenly they you know, they are incorporeal or the When you the walk around, virtual. they change. He also reminded me, in a way, of Vassarelli or Iverell, in terms of as you move, the sculpture moves with it you. It moves with you, and, and then the idea that you can put two surfaces together. You can put, like, one parallel set of parallel lines, and then you put another, you know, plexiglass in front of it. And when you look at them together, you, you don't look at one surface or the other, but you look at, an, at the interaction of both. So the image that you're looking doesn't really exist. It exists only in your mind as you see it. So it's really uh, incredible. And we've had uh, great artists from, you know, uh, uh, Panama, uh, from Guatemala, from Brazil, from Argentina. But this idea that we, most of our artists are not well known has very much defined the culture of our museum because we can't rely on blockbusters. Like what I was telling you, most museums are full of opportunity for the famous and the dead. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult for a young artist to enter them. And even for a good artist that is not a blockbuster, it's difficult. And, and, yet, and then, on the contrary, you have a very limited group of stars that get shown again and again and again. Who, I mean, who would those be? Well, the, the Impressionists, of course. Uh, you know, poor Van Gogh every time. He, King Tut. He, King Tut. I mean, can't believe the lack of imagination that we're, you know, what, 20 years later? Doing, doing it again. The blockbusters of yesteryear. Can't they come up with anything different? And it's all the same. Picasso. But it's a very limited pantheon of people. And, and so... Uh, what we do is that since most of the artists we show are unknown, 
we need other ways of bringing the audience. There, there was one I loved. I love that woman's work. That's, Who uh, is it? Marta Menuhin. I mean, it's just fabulous, and it's made of styrofoam. Yeah, she's a disciple of Andy Warhol. Because, you know, the other very, well, I was finishing the idea about how, so we've, we've developed into a whole space where we have concerts, we have uh, food tastings, we have symphonic orchestras playing. In other words, we have all kinds of activities that bring people. I was down there for Valentine's Day, and you had a Valentine's Day party we where you Valentine's had the children. We have Valentine's Day party. We do Mother's Day. Uh, and we you even had a table for singles so they could be Valentine's the following year. Of course, year. you know, you try to... <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a lively museum. It's exciting, and it's expanding. Who, who did this piece, the piece of sculpture that we just I passed? was talking about Martha Manuel, she's yeah. a disciple of Andy Warhol. Yeah. And lived in New York many years, and now this is Soto that you see. Again, this is kind of where you can walk into that piece. Can you imagine? It's really, really well. I've done it, so I know what it's, you're saying. It's extraordinary, and uh, the other wonderful thing about Latin American art is that it's much less homogenous than in the U.S. or in Europe. Among other things, because you don't you don't have a, a strong, a critical establishment in Latin America, and you don't have as good communications in Latin America. So here, you know, if somebody makes it in New York, they know about it. Instantly. Ten minutes yeah, yeah. later in California, it, instantly, and almost immediately everybody starts doing the same thing, and they know about it in Berlin. So you tend to see uh, very similar efforts, whereas in Latin America, sometimes in the same country, in the same city, you can have somebody working in surrealism, another in abstraction, and somebody else experimenting with pop art, and other. In other words, there's a it does, there's no pope. There's no uh, person that says this is good or this is bad, this is old or this is new. And, uh, and that gives the artists a lot of freedom to innovate, to improvise, and to be different and exciting. And so I would say that if there's uh, any unifying characteristic in Latin American art today, it would be pre precisely that there is no unifying characteristic, that there's many. And uh, that is immediately obvious when you come into this museum. It's vibrant, it's exciting. And something else I'd like to say is that the fact that the original collection was done by physicians that wanted to heal people gives the collection a certain, I mean, of course now we have curators and all that, but this is not a collection made by curators. This is not a collection made by people that are looking at, you know, the recent review in the New York Times and deciding who is important and who is not according to somebody else's criteria. One of the cancers of museums today is curators that don't trust them to their own, their own taste, that can't say, I believe in this, this is good, and shoot me. They always have to be looking at what somebody else said, and or if somebody's uh, important says that this artist is great, then they say it's great as well. Nobody wants to, to uh, so I find sometimes you go to these museums and you say, how could they show this something that's so incredibly bad? It's so <laughs> terrible. It's such a fraud. But nobody dares to say that it's a fraud, like the Oscar Wilde uh, story about the guy, the, the, the emperor with no clothes. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and nobody wants to appear uh, you know, I reactionary, had a or, or, and, and so it's... I had a show in my gallery once, Steve Martin, who is now a famous, famous uh, movie star. and The comedian, he, the white-haired guy? Yeah, and he was unknown The one that had, the, had an exhibit in Vegas in the Bellagio? With yeah, his yeah, of his own collection. But I showed him in my gallery on La Cienega in Los Angeles, and he had a show of invisible art. I was in, in, <laughs> in New York, and I rented him the space, and I looked on NBC, and there it was. Everything was just pedestals with nothing on it. And it was actually reviewed in the LA Times as the Emperor's New Clothes. So I love that. I love the analogy you're making. Tell me about some of the muralists. You've done virtual reality murals down there where you've actually set up uh, a system where you can show Dega Rivera. You've shown Siqueiros, Orozco. Tell well, me about that's, that. Well, uh, that's my lifetime project, and I can't wait to go to New York someday. Uh, you see, forever you have heard that murals can't move. Right, that right. That you can't move a mural. Well, right. maybe you could, but at great expense and difficulty. Uh, but now, with the modern technology, uh, with uh, the, you know, all the computers and the photographic techniques and all this, it is possible to project a mural uh, at, at its actual size of the, of the original. Uh -huh, with yeah. a fidelity that sometimes is even better than the mural because the photograph was taken when the mural was fresher or whatever it is. So what I've done is, and I've gone to, you know, not only California, but Mexico, Europe, uh, recently in the Florence Biennial, 
And I do these lectures on Diego Rivera, or Siqueiros, or Orozco, or Tamayo, in which I project some of their murals life-size. And so I tell you their life, and then I, and all, and I, and I do some of these lectures in big interior spaces. In California, we have a popular series called Murals Under the Stars, in which we, we have this big parking lot with a huge white wall, and so we do it there. And it's fantastic. It's a way of uh, bringing murals uh, and sharing art in a, in a new way, you know? Do you do them at night? If it's outdoors, I have to do them at night, obviously, <laughs> and, hope, <laughs> and hope I don't have a very full moon. Uh, but I also do them indoors, and, and I, you know, originally I, I started this because I wanted to go to the schools. And uh, I found that the murals uh, were big enough to, to, to impress the kids. I mean, you suddenly blast the cicadas that is, you know, 30 feet wide and 15 tall, and uh, it, it gets their attention. Tell me about Sahiras. He was a muralist, and a lot of his work has been destroyed. Wasn't he actually a communist and also a fighter? Didn't he try well, to the, kill Trotsky? To, to say that Sikaitos was a communist is, is, is an understatement. He was a, <laughs> he was a, a man whose FBI <laughs> files had yeah. over 100,000 entries. He was, a, he was a rabid communist. He was a, a soldier in the revolution. He also uh, enlisted in the, Sp in the Spanish Civil War in its battle against the Nazis. Uh, he was a union organizer. He did try to assassinate Trotsky. And why was uh, Trotsky saved? Well, he Trotsky, jumped under the bed, didn't he? Trotsky was saved because uh, he, he, he ducked. He did duck. <laughs> Remember when Reagan got shot uh, that he said, honey, I forgot to duck. <laughs> he told Nancy. Well, yeah. Trotsky did duck. He jumped, jumped under the bed. Under the bed yeah. And the wife covered him. And so all the bullets of cicadas went over the bed. Well, was Siqueiros a romantic under all of the military things we hear about him? Well, you see, the problem I find is that Siqueiros was so, is so controversial politically yeah. that people often overlook his artistic contributions. And I'm going to tell you something, and I know that many won't like it, but I think that Siqueiros is the most innovative artist of the 20th century. Do you really? Oh, well, I know you've said he influenced Pollock. I find that hard to believe. He taught him. Tell me. Oh, absolutely. Pollock was a, 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 no, we're talking about Jackson a young Pollock, man, of yeah. course, who, who uh, all this idea of the drip painting was invented by Siqueiros. He, he, he had, uh, Siqueiros is the first to start using this uh, synthetic paints. I don't know how you call it Resins. in English, pir piroxilina. Okay, no? go on. Yeah. And, uh, and he uh, describes all this in letters of how with th this acrylics, if you put one drop and then you put another drop, it produces a reaction. Right, right. And, and he calls this the controlled accident. And Jackson Pollock was a disciple of Siqueiros. Siqueiros had a New York no. in the mid-30s. He had a, uh, what the, the called the experimental uh, workshop. And Siqueiros was a disciple, uh, I mean, Pollock was a disciple of Siqueiros. Uh, and basically, he, he took all of these uh, contributions, all these things that Siqueiros had uh, taught him, and he made a career out of it. But of course, uh, nobody talks about Cicadas or the other muralists. That's funny. I know. You they're, have they're actually like, suggested, they've disappeared from You have suggested history. that the federal government actually brought the abstract expressionists into fruition to get rid of the muralists. Well, of course, and not, not, not just me. I mean, this is a, a proven fact now that we can see the information uh, in through the... the on, there was actually a whole cultural war cold, in the Cold War years. And, uh, of course, the, the idea was that uh, to promote, you know, a, a, an art that was not militant and political, like, like uh, the muralists, uh, and uh, to basically erase uh, the, the role that the muralists had, which were, of course, uh, avid communists and which created a, a very political art that... Uh, generated uh, all kinds of, of controversy. You know? Even Philip Guston, it's been discovered, did a mural that people are trying to get money actually to bring it into this oh, country. Oh, that is a marvel. I had the chance of visiting. Philip Guston, I can't believe this. Philip Guston, the missing link in Philip Guston's career is in Mexico, in, in, a, in a place called Michoacán, in Morelia. And this is a, a, a mural that 
is incredible. It has uh, the whole uh, Lea Polar, my, my, my friend uh, introduced me to, to this mural. It ha it's it's the, the, the Inquisition and the Klux Klux Klan, and it's incredible. Now they're trying to restore it. I don't know, Lea was trying to coordinate something with this, but uh, it is, you know, Augustine's career, you know, cannot be understood without this, what, the, because he, he, as you were saying, he ends his career painting again some of these uh, nightmarish well, images. Well, for, for years in New York, you couldn't, um, if you stepped out of sight of the abstract expressionist goals, you couldn't get a show. And Gustin painted that way for years and then got bored and went back to painting the Ku Klux Klan. People picketed his shows. He had trouble getting galleries. And de Kooning said to him once, you've paid your dues. Go on, do what you want to do. And then with that kind of acceptance, uh, people sort of fell into line. But it's amazing how people were almost like sheep in ignoring him after he did make this change. You know, the, 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 the great chapter uh, in culture in this continent that needs to be written is precisely this dialogue between, you know, the North and the South. How do you mean? Well, uh, there is a profound influence of the Mexican muralists with the abstract expressionists that you can see not only in the dripping technique that I described, but in the scale, uh, the size of the work, many things. In the fact that there is a, 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 an enormous presence of Diego Rivera, all of these artists. But there is also an enormous presence of the great American authors in Latin America. Acknowledged by the same artist, Garcia Marquez, says that uh, when he read Faulkner, he, con he conceived a lot of his ideas that he would later develop. Uh, Hemingway, his influence in authors like Vargas Llosa is enormous. This, this way of writing, very, the, 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 the music. You have uh, Copeland and, and Revueltas and the, the, the exchange of, of ideas in, in, in ballet. That is something that I, that I love uh, enormously. Uh, all the disciples of Martha Graham and uh, Limon ha have flourished in Mexico and had a direct influence on modern dance in Mexico. Even uh, classical ballet, uh, Gloria Contreras, Balanchine's disciple, has worked in. In, in I think Mexico. it's only fair to say your mother is and was a world famous dancer who actually danced with Valentine. Exactly, it was what I'm trying. You know, so so it's a uh, it's a whole set of dialogues of influences of enrichments of artists that are uh, I think needed to talk more about, not just. Uh, if, if you read a lot of the art history texts, would have you believe that... Uh, it never existed. It never existed, that the connection is uh, through Paris and, and then to abstract expressionism, as if all the muralist movement did not even... It, 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 it's what, what angers me so much is that they, they treat the, the Mexican muralist movement as a footnote. Absolutely. They lump it up but there you with, will change with all the that. social realists of the Soviet Union and China, and they deny that muralism is also an expression of modern art. Where can we see the Siqueiros murals here in Los Angeles? You really can't. <laughs> <laughs> you have, a, well, there is one in the Museum of Santa Barbara that yeah. is beautifully restored. And then there is this huge controversial one in Plaza Olvera that the Getty has been re re trying to restore. It's actually in the railroad station? It's in Olvera Street, in, yeah, the, in yeah. the Italian Hall. Uh, who would ever imagine, though, that the money of John Paul Getty would end up <laughs> used to restore <laughs> the mural of Siqueiros? So that one is, they're, they're trying to restore it, but the problem is there's no more mural. This is the one where he paints the crucified immigrant in the center that was so shocking. Oh, you know, he, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I have that mural. I show that. Uh, in my in my virtual presentations, and then there's another one that they recently discovered, that is uh, uh, yet to be uncovered. A uh, workers' meeting. So Siqueiros with Rivera, Rivera, you can see a couple of Rivera murals in San Francisco, the at City Clark College, Tower. at the Stock Exchange, at the Arts Institute. No, the San Francisco Arts, Arts Institute. Institute. I just want to say something. Um, Orozco, probably the only muralist you can see uh, in New York would be Orozco in the New Worker School. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, years ago, uh, Gronk, who's a Hispanic artist, could not get a show here. So he took all of his work, called a press conference, took it to the L.A. County Museum on Wilshire and Fairfax, and burned it. 
it got everybody's attention. He was a master at uh, getting PR for himself. Today, he's one of the leading artists. He has led the way for many Latin American mm -hmm. artists to show at the museum. He has also had one-person shows there. So it's almost as if a group tries to keep a group out so that they can keep control. But once a foothold is open, they're, they're in. And then the next group will be persecuted. Do you, are you aware of that? Did you know this about Gronk? Well, I... I, I I, I wasn't aware of it. It sounds absolutely brilliant. Oh, I showed him after that. I showed him and it became, not because of me, but he became a huge star. But I, I think that um, what, what I, as a curator, as a, as a director, uh, I, I think it's very important that, that you're honest and that you show things that you really believe in, come what may. Uh, because I'm also against uh, this idea that, you know, that people pressure themselves into a museum. I think that uh, what made the, 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 the muralist, and that they end up being shown there, not because of their artistic merit, but because they belong to the correct group, and, and they claim to be uh, underrepresented. I find that terrible. Uh, I find it terrible, for example, that some English uh, schools choose the authors they read, not by the quality of their books, but by their gender or by their race. I think that's terrible. You know, uh, but anyway, I think that's uh, another discussion. Another <laughs> discussion. Thank you, Gregorio. Um, art is not for everyone. It never has been. It never will be. But for those of you who love it like Gregorio does and like I do, we want to turn you on. I'm Molly Barnes. Please go to the Long Beach Museum of Latin American Art next time you're in Los Angeles. Actually, it's in Long Beach, and it's a treat, and he will welcome you there. Thanks, Absolutely. Gregorio.